Welcome everybody. Thank you all for coming. My name is Father Tony Sylvia. I am a priest with the Apostolic Joe and I Church, and that's what we'll be talking about uh, this uh, this afternoon. So, a lot of people ask what the Joanite Church is and how it fits in with the uh, kind of spectrum of Gnosticism, uh, both ancient and modern. So I'm going to touch on a little bit of those uh, questions today. We'll talk about the early origins of the Johannites uh, through the Knights Templar and our, our traditional history and uh, all the way up until the modern age. Um, so to start with, uh, we'll talk about the very first uh, Johannites, they were called, well, scholars call them Johannines, the Johannine community, uh, and there's a point where we make a switch to use the T to differentiate it. Um, but it all starts essentially with the Gospel of John, the fourth Gospel of the Canonical Bible. The uh, reason why we have um, so many Gnostics that consider themselves part of the Joanite stream today, if not specifically Joanite, at least a lot of Gnostic churches uh, identify with the fourth gospel, um, is because the gospel writers in the around AD 90, the fourth gospel, whoever wrote the fourth gospel, uh, the beloved disciple, there's a lot of stuff in there that can be interpreted Gnostically. And I'll, I'll talk a little bit about those specific things here. But anyway, so the fourth gospel uh, narrates on two levels. Uh, it's important to understand that, y yes, this is a story of Jesus' life um, as told through the lens of somebody uh, who, is, who, doesn't, who isn't named throughout the Bible. Uh, but it's, it's called the, uh, the beloved disciple, uh, the, the, the disciple that Je whom Jesus loved, uh, and all those kinds of things. Um, I might as well bring out the book now. This is one of the Joanites' most favoritist books, The Community of the Beloved Disciple by Raymond Brown. And it is a fantastic piece of scholarship about the fourth gospel, and it walks through the history of what was happening in the Middle East around the time when the gospel was written. Um, and if you're interested in, in history or the Bible at all, I recommend reading it. It's easy to read. It isn't very scholarly. Uh, well, it's very scholarly, but it isn't written uh, academically. It's written for a layperson, and it's a fantastic book. And I don't get paid to say that. <laughs> so, uh, one quote from Brown. Uh, he says, What has happened in the fourth gospel is that the vocabulary of the evangelist time has been read back into the ministry of Jesus. So, scholars tend to agree that the fourth gospel was written about A.D. 90, give or take, uh, because of a lot of the references that are in it. Um, some of the references are kind of pre um, the destruction of the temple, about AD 70, and some of them are a little bit post the destruction of the temple. So uh, let's talk about the very first stage. Oh, well, actually, let me go back. Um, so the, the way that the gospel is written, the way that the gospel is written, it's a it's a it's a narrative of the life of Jesus and the acts of you know the apostles around that time, but it's also a reflection of what's happening to the Joannine community in the late first century uh, or into the the beginning of the second century. So uh, we'll talk a little bit about each of those those points in turn. But the first stage um, of the Johannine community happens about 50 A.D. to about 80 A.D. The early Joannines were, they would consider themselves Jewish. They worshipped in the synagogue. They weren't very radically different from the other Jewish communities of that time period, except that they considered Jesus to be the Jewish Messiah. Not a divine figure, um, at least not any more divine than any other person, but uh, the Messiah that was prophesized uh, in the Old Testament. So, the beloved disciple is a member of this community, whoever the beloved disciple happens to be. The, and, and it might be a compilation of, of many people we obviously don't know, but the, the person who we refer to, or the, the figure we refer to as the beloved disciple, is a member of this, this community. So this Jewish Messiah is fulfilling the prophecy that somebody will come and fix all the bad stuff that's happening in the Jewish community. Um, a lot of the, the Jews at that time would have read a lot of um, the Roman occupation into the Old Testament, and we see that time and time again. Uh, and so Jesus came as a man 
to liberate the Jews as the Jewish Messiah. So this is the very first stages of what would become the Johannine community uh, before the gospel is written. So, yeah, not all that. Okay, before this, what we call the second stage, which is about the time of the writing of the gospel, there's another group of people that come in to this community. And they're, um, uh, they're Samaritans. So the, you read a lot in the Gospel of John about the Samaritans, uh, the woman at the well, uh, the Samaritan woman. The Samaritan woman. <laughs> little echo there, that's fun. Um, and they come in here uh, and they see things in a uh, mosaic fashion rather than a Davidic fashion. So they're looking at, um, at the, the Old Testament as you know, the law as opposed to the succession of kings. Uh, so this group comes in. They aren't specifically, they aren't the same Jews that are in the uh, in the synagogues worshiping, this kind of leads to a schism, where in the se in the second stage, about 90 A.D., um, this second group coming in brings what we call a high Christology, which means that they interpret Jesus as a divine figure who has come to Earth to help. So, so not a not a man who has come to fulfill a prophecy, but a, a divine figure, a God figure, um, and this is where an awful lot of uh, Christianity didn't have this up until then. I mean, Christianity was almost nothing before this before this time. Um, scholars uh, would tend to agree that before the fourth gospel was written, there were little groups here and there that had ideas about what was going on, but they certainly didn't have the well they didn't have the weight of history behind them at that point it was it was all kind of brand new everybody was telling different stories about Jesus and all the things that he did so this but this was the first time that it brought a high christology a divine figure into the story of Jesus so that's kind of a textual criticism it doesn't really say anything about whether Jesus was or wasn't divine we're just talking about the group of people whose idea this you know was that codified it into books uh, all right, so as a result of the acceptance of the second group, the Johannine community was expelled from the synagogue. At this point in the, in the fourth gospel, you start to see people uh, talking about the Jews expelling them from the synagogue. You know, they, they start to talk about um, the Jews as the other, as opposed to, you know, we're Jews, they're Jews, but we disagree on this one point. It's now, we're something else, the Jews kicked us out, aren't we sad? That kind of thing. So this is a, uh, a, a an important turning point in the Johannine community. The successful evangelism that's been happening, the the bringing in of the new groups, um, the purge of the uh, the purge reaction to the destruction of the temple, and the disagreement with the high Christology uh, formed two specific groups. Uh, at this point, there is nothing that we can call Orthodox Christian belief. You know, certainly not in the way that we see out there today, even though there's a lot of little disagreements on, on fine points here and there. Um, there's, no, there's no ecumenical councils. There's no groups who are arguing really over um, the finer points. We're still kind of wrestling with big issues here. Was Jesus divine or was he not or was he just a dude? So this is, uh, this is an important turning point in the history. Um, so the beloved disciple is an important part of this process as well. So whoever the beloved disciple is, is crucial in accepting that high Christological uh, idea, merging it in with the fourth gospel. In the beginning was the word, and the word was with God. Um, so that's the high Christology there, being written into the story of Jesus that may or may not have existed, written before that time. Uh, all right. So the gospel uh, explains Jewish terms that, this is a quote from my patriarch, the gospel explains Jewish terms that even Greek-speaking Jews would not have failed to understand. Um, right at the beginning, they, they say, they call Jesus rabbi, and then in the little parentheses, which means teacher. And all of the Jews knows, knew what rabbi meant. Even if you spoke Greek at the time, you knew what rabbi meant. It was one of those words that you know, everybody was, was using. It was a, a title of respect, of, of endearment. Um, so this means that there's other groups coming in that don't know the whole Jewish history and the whole, you know, this is, this is the Gentiles coming in now. Uh, 
and you see that start to be layered over on top of the fourth gospel. All right. So then we come to the third stage. The Gentile converts are coming in. The non-Jewish converts are coming in. Uh, you start to see a, a stark break from Judaism at this point. The third stage essentially leads to the split that will become the Proto-Orthodox Johannines and the Gnostic Johannites. The third group uh, begins to split under its own disagreements about the interpretations. Um, they all pretty much have a high Christology at this point, uh, whether they become the Proto-Orthodox or whether they become the, the Gnostics. The, there's always a pre-existent Christ that comes down and, and helps humanity. There are other what would become the Proto-Orthodox Christian groups that are helping, or that are out there and they're, they're doing their own teachings, and they may disagree with the Johannines on certain points, um, but they're willing to accept the high Christology that the Johannines are espousing. Other Christian groups aren't, but there's an effort at this point in history to kind of try and bring everybody under the same tent and teach the same thing as the movement grows. So you see um, other Christian groups start to say to the Johannines or the Johannines to the other Christian groups, you know, maybe we should talk, you know, maybe we should get together, or maybe we should, you know, we have this idea over here, you have this idea over here, let's put them together, see what comes out of it. Um, but not all the Johannines are on board with that. So there's a split in the, in the Johannine community towards the end, um, about 100 AD. Uh, so the split happens along essentially Gnostic lines, or what will become proto-Gnostic, we'll say proto-Gnostic lines. There's actually a nice little diagram in the book here that I'll show you. So this is the first group, the second group, and then here's the split. So the proto-Orthodox group splits off over this way, and the epistles are written, the first and second letters of John. And they are written in order to interpret the fourth gospel in a way that will be acceptable to this new group of people that they want to hang out with over here. The proto-Gnostic over here, this is the group that writes the secret book of John. This is the group that goes fully Gnostic, and eventually will lead to uh, not all, but certainly a lot of the Gnostic thought that we, that, that we have today. A lot of the stuff from the Nag Hammadi Library can trace its roots back to this information, if not this specific group. So that's why uh, some people say all Gnosticism is Joanite, um, although some people wouldn't say that, but <laughs> who knows? All right, so what have I missed? Okay, so the uh, Proto-Orthodox um, kind of starts to become coherent at this point. Um, High Christology, the Eucharist, uh, and, and the Hellenistic uh, adherents, the Gentiles, are, and the, the Samaritan converts, those are the issues that break up the Johannine community, and they go off into other things. So, you see universalism come, come through in the gospel. That's a point that is contended by both, both sides, that the world may be saved through Jesus. You know, that's, that comes up in the gospel. Now, later groups would go on to say, well, we didn't mean everybody. We just meant the people who, you know, were, were like us. And the Gnostics and some, other, some of the Gnostic groups would go on to say, no, no, we mean everybody. So, that's one of the points of contention. Uh... Yeah. No, oh, yes. Here's an interesting point, too. The Gentile converts, the Hellenistic, um, you know, Greek-speaking people who didn't know what the Jewish stuff was they were, that they were talking about, uh, they bring words into the Gospels, as to the fourth Gospel, that did not appear in other Gospels, at least not in the way that it's used, especially logos, which is the Greek word for word. So, in the beginning was the word, and the word was with God. That's the Greek word logos there. And it's also a figure from Neoplatonism. There's the Logos is a divine figure. So you've got Neoplatonism coming in through the Jews, I mean through the, um, the Greek speakers, merging with the Johannine community and popping out as Gnostic on the other side. So I think that's fairly interesting. <laughs> All right.
Mm -hmm. Okay. So that kind of leads us into the fourth stage with the dissolution of the Johannine community, and then we start to talk about the Proto-Orthodox and the Johannites, the Johannite Gnostics. That's the term that we use. I'm not sure that many scholars would necessarily use that same term, but that's, that's how we do it. So, uh, Brown calls them the secessionists, by the way. So, the, uh, incidentally, the secessionist group is believed to have been much, much larger than the proto-Orthodox group. So, um, I don't know who seceded from whom. <laughs> yeah, exactly, you know. And so, just because the proto-Orthodox ended up with the majority a century later, for a very long time after the split, the, the Gnostic Joannites were the, the majority group. So... That happened. All right. So here are four elements that are present in the fourth gospel that would have been um, would have been pleasing to the Gnostics of of the day. So the the character of the prologue. The prologue, of course, you know, is that in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God. Um, that whole section about talking about the heavenly realms. All right, that's very Gnostic. Gnostics love to quote that, and it's fantastic. Um, there is a, an element of dualism that you can read into the fourth gospel. Um, the Orthodox Christians have kind of a love-hate relationship with dualism. Uh, there's there's dualism in Christianity. I think no matter how you slice it, some people want to paint it with a different brush, um, but. Uh, the Gnostics certainly embraced the dualism, uh, and they might not have called it dualism either. There's a lot of modern Gnostics who shy away from the word dualism, but I think it's appropriate. Um, all right, the idea of a descent, a descent of a savior figure. Um, the, the savior figure pre-existed. That is accepted amongst both Christians and Gnostics. One of the other things that differentiates the Gnostics from the Orthodox Christians is that humanity also pre-existed. Um, so you were not, you know, th you aren't granted a soul when you're about to be born or whatever it happens to be. I mean, there's all sorts of um, controversy over that as well. But you existed before you existed here on Earth. And this is the temporary reality, and that's the real reality. So that's, you can certainly read a lot of that into into the fourth gospel. And determinism, the, the that the world might be saved, you know. All right, so I want to go over a few points from our statement of principles, and I want to talk about how those relate to uh, ideas in the fourth gospel. Um, it, for those of you who don't know, our statement of principles is a statement of nine paragraphs or sentences that kind of sum up everything that is common about the Joannite tradition, the modern Joannite tradition. There is uh, a considerable amount of wiggle room and interpretation space, I guess you'd call it, in these uh, nine statements of principles. We don't really say very much that is specific and hard and concrete. We're much more interested in having people come to things on their own uh, than being told this is true, that is not that kind of thing. Um, that's one of the, I think, one of the great things about Gnosticism in general is, you know, there's, you can come to it on your own. You don't have to be spoon-fed. And there, again, there's universal truth, and there's things that aren't very important. And some things fall on different points on that line. So anyway, one point that is emphasized in the fourth gospel is the high Christology, as we talked about. The pre-existence of Christ, the Logos, being one with the divine. Um, so here in the statement of principles, in points four and five, I'll read them to you. We affirm that the Godhead is composed of three persons, which are one in substance, God, the Father Almighty, the Son, the Logos, or Christos Soter, and the Holy Spirit, or Numa Hagion. And uh, point five, we affirm that God guides us towards unity by the loving example of the incarnate Christos manifested in the life of Jesus and the ongoing experience of the Holy Spirit as the source of continued inspiration and, re and revelation via Gnosis. So these are points that we come to through an interpretation of the fourth gospel. And very Gnostic. All right, an incarnational theology. This is, again, talking about the 
pre-existent Christos descending, becoming human, helping us with our stuff, whatever we've got going on. So there's a focus on the divinity of Jesus rather than simply his humanity, uh, the coming of the Logos. There's a lesser significance given specifically to the ministry of Jesus, uh, more significance on, on the mere existence of Jesus. So uh, four in, uh, statement of principles four and five point to this and also six. So I'll read you six now. We affirm the one holy Catholic and apostolic church that is built on the message and authority of the incarnate Christos, and the same lives from age to age by the guidance of the Holy Spirit and the stewardship of the successors of the apostles. Notice we talk a lot about, uh, uh, in our statement of principles, and, and even when we talk about other Gnostic points, that we talk a lot about the Logos and the Holy Spirit, um, or the Christos and the Holy Spirit. There's uh, subtle differences on what we mean when we use those two words, but they're not terribly important at this time. But, so, but we don't really talk much about the Father um, as a direct intercessor. That's because for us, the Logos and the Holy Spirit, I think I have a nice quote about that later, but we'll see. If I don't have a quote about the Holy Spirit and the Logos, then remind me later and I'll see if I can remember it. <laughs> but we, but those, the Holy Spirit and the Logos are the two parts of the Trinity that interact with us on a world scale. And the Father is transcendent. Um, and it's just a difference of, of roles. It's not a difference of, like, there's actually three different persons, but each part of the Trinity has a specific job to do and the Logos and the Holy Spirit, their job is here. All right, I'm going to throw some fun words at you. A realized eschatology, which is one of my favorite theological words. Um, eschatology means how the world will be saved or how the individual will be saved. It's a, um, how the world will end kind of thing. Uh, realized eschatology. So salvation is accomplished by the act of the descent of the word, not through the death of Jesus on the cross, but by the act of incarnation. That is the salvation. That's the, sa the saving act. So, uh, knowing that the Logos, so, uh, Gnosis, realization, knowing the Logos as the reception of eternal life. Once you have that knowledge, that Gnosis, that is the eternal life. It's not, you know, say you believe in Jesus and go to church on Sundays and you'd be cool. So, uh, the sacrifice of the divine into the limitations of matter, that's a line from our liturgy. Um, Je uh, Jesus was sacrificed on the cross of the elements. Sometimes you'll hear in esoteric circles or in Gnostic circles. So, you hear about the elements, the four classical elements, earth, air, fire, and water. They're often depicted in a cross. So, Jesus incarnating into matter, into the world of the elements, that is the sacrifice of the cross, not some Romans who were angry and killed a guy. So... That's an important point. Um, eschatology, not as the end of the world, but the rebirth of it. Salvation is present now. I think that's an important point. Uh, the Gospel of Philip um, has a couple of things to say about this. It's a Valentinian scripture. Uh, the world has become the aeon, or the eternal realm, the aeon, um, which is kind of like the heavenly uh, reality, the divine reality. Uh, also says... And I thought I had written that down here somewhere, but I guess I hadn't. Um, help me out with a quote here. Jesus said he'll die first and then rise. Yeah. Right there, if you experience the resurrection while you live, after you die, you will see that. Yeah. And that actually comes up twice in the Gospel of Philip. There's once in reference to us, and there's once in reference to Jesus. Those who said Jesus died and was resurrected are in error. And so those who say that we have to die and then be resurrected are in error. So it, again, that's a very kind of high Christological point. And uh, you'll see that, again, a pre-existent Christos, a pre-existent soul, you know, pre-existent humanity, that kind of thing. This, um, this is illustrated in our Statement of Principles, point two. <clears throat> Excuse me. We affirm that every being contains the sacred flame a spark of the divine, and that awareness of the sacred flame within constitutes the highest level of self-knowledge and the experience of God simultaneously. This act of awareness, which is held to be liberating, transcendent, and experiential, is called gnosis. Feel free to stop me also at any point if you have questions. On that. <laughs> is that distracting? Yeah. Mm -hmm. All right. 
Pneumatology. Here we go. We're talking about the Holy Spirit. Pneumatology is the study of the Holy Spirit. Um, pneuma in Greek meaning spirit. It also means breath. Uh, it's a, a nice little symbol there. I like. Oh, okay, here's the, here's the quote I was talking about earlier. Uh, the pneuma agion, the Holy Spirit, or the paraclete, which is uh, a Greek word that means helper of some kind. I think it's helper. It comes alongside to help. Yeah. So, paraclete, yeah. Paraclete. Not parakeet, although they're delightful as well. Um, the, uh, so, I'll break it down and not use Greek. The, uh, the Holy Spirit serves the same revelatory role in relation to the Logos that the Logos serves with regard to the Father. So, the Logos reveals the Father to humanity. In the same way, the Holy Spirit reveals the, logo t the Logos to us. So it's not exactly a, a tiered structure, but here we are, right? And here's the Holy Spirit, the intercessor between the Logos and us. And here's the Logos, the intercessor between us and the Father. So if I had a chart, I would draw it, but it's not worth it. Those three points. So the relationship from the Father to the Logos is the same as the Logos to the Holy Spirit. And all of those work towards helping us down on the earth here. Um, okay. So the Holy Spirit is responsible for the teaching of the adherent. All that we, when we talk about teaching in the church, we talk about div revealed teachings or divine revelation. We're talking about the Holy Spirit. We're talking about the Holy Spirit speaking through the scriptures. Excuse me. We're talking about the Holy Spirit speaking through other people, through prophets, what have you. Um, you know, the Holy Spirit probably spoke to Philip K. Dick. We were talking about him earlier. Uh, so, that, you know, the Holy Spirit helped Philip K. Dick uh, with his uh, revelation, although he did have a difficult time with that in his life. The patriarch is too smart for his own good. He's using all kinds of foreign language in here. The experience of the paraclete is a type of parousia, or second coming. The logos returning through the paraclete to the in individual believer. So the second coming is not an event that will happen in the future. You know, there's, there isn't going to be a rapture and there's going to be a bunch of clothes left on the ground while a bunch of naked people fly up through the sky. Yeah, <laughs> The second coming, coming is happening all the time in the person of the Holy Spirit. It's, the second coming is happening, is revealing itself to us if we are able to listen all the time. That goes to statement of, the Statement of Principles points 5 and 6, which I've already read. Differing ecclesiology. Ecclesiology means study of the church. Ecclesia is a Greek word for church. <coughs> so there's a favorable or tolerant view of apostolic Christians. Now we see that through the group that split off and became the, um, the uh, uh, proto-Orthodox church. But there's always been an apostolic reverence in the Joannite tradition. Uh, we always look back to the authority of the apostles. And this is why we have apostolic succession in our church today. No evidence that the community condemned apostolic succession offices or sacramental practice. I don't know if that, all right. Um, but although, with, with that being said, weight is always placed on the experience of the Holy Spirit rather than the individual structural mediation. So, um, his eminence has a little note here that he put in here. I'm st I, I stole these notes from our patriarch, kind of, whole cloth. He did a fantastic lecture on it, which is why I'm kind of breezing through it. He'll, it'll be up on YouTube, actually, kind of shortly. Um, so you can see that, and he goes into a lot more detail. So uh, he would say that um, experience of the Holy Spirit is placed before the institutional or structural mediation, rather than instead of. Um, so... What that means is we have a reverence for the apostolic succession. We have a, reference for, a reverence for our hierarchical structure. You know, obviously we have priests and bishops and, and, and the whole thing. But none of that is as important as the individual revelation of the Holy Spirit to each individual person. So uh, as, as clergy, as a, you know, the, the, the bishops, the hierarchical structure, the churchy look of the whole thing, that all exists in order to help people to come to that revelation of the Holy Spirit. It really isn't there because, you know, we like to wear funny clothes and, and fancy hats and, and whatnot. It's, it's a, um, uh, what is it that he says? It's a, uh, 
I forget the quote exactly. He has he has a great my patriarch has a great way of putting it. Um, but anyway, so the focus of the ch the work of the church is placed on being a disciple rather than obeying the apostles. And we're all called to be disciples, just like the beloved disciple. And I will actually go through that uh, point in a little bit, because um, uh, His Eminence has a really fantastic, I think, uh, interpretation of the symbolic, uh, the symbolic beloved disciple as a model for our own discipleship. We'll talk about that in a minute. But, um, but anyway, so that's kind of what the foundations of Joanite spirituality is about. As far now as the history moving forward from this point, we have groups that